Evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown. Uh, not doing the power hour, just doing the introduction. Uh, Keith McLachlan from uh, Alpha Wealth, small mid cap fund manager. There will be talking around small caps, how to spot them, how to identify them, how to look for small cap funds, um, and then he'll give us some small caps to look at uh, that he particularly likes. Guys, thanks for braving uh, roadworks and cold Joburg uh, air and everything and coming out tonight. The objective of tonight really is a start to end guide for investors in small caps um, it, it's quite simple starting with the premise that you guys know absolutely nothing uh, I'm gonna end up with uh, that hopefully you can walk out and not just know the background to small cap investing no roots to small cap investing no allocations know what you want um, and at least give you the tools to start to do this on your own um, it's it's a massive, massive uh, 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 amount of information we're going through. So the only way to do that is to be brief on certain points. Pretty much every slide in this presentation, you could do a presentation just on that slide. So um, I'm going to go through it. Um, and at the start, there, there'll be stuff that uh, absolute newbies and absolute beginners will find interesting. And as we go through, you'll probably find that some of the more experienced people will take value from the second half of the presentation. Um, but like I said, the question and answer portion of, of, of this presentation is probably, uh, will probably have a lot of value because there will be topics I skimmed over and touch uh, or didn't. Or, yeah, didn't even touch on and the like and questions you guys have around that. So please make full use of that. So jumping straight into it, obviously uh, a presentation about start to end investing in small caps. Uh, the starting question is what are small caps? Uh, small caps is, it has no legal definition. It is, uh, it's what I call an economic definition or working definition. And the way I explain small caps, and by the way, the full term is small capitalization companies. Um, the, full, uh, the way I loosely define small caps is small, fast-growing, investable listed companies. That definition has four parts to it. So let's just touch on those parts. Small, so it's market capitalization. Market capitalization is the number of shares in the company multiplied by the share price, i.e. if you bought every single share in a company, how big, how much would you have to spend on it, i.e. the size of the company. Um, and I tend to define small as market caps of 1 billion US dollars and down. Uh, that's roughly 15, I don't know by now, it might be 16 or 17 billion rand and down market uh, uh, in terms of market caps. So that sounds like a lot of money. In the listed environment, market cap of 15 billion is actually very, very small. Um, just view this in the context of the trillion rand listed companies we have on the JSE and the multi-billion dollar, like hundreds if not thousands of billion dollar uh, uh, market cap sitting overseas. Suddenly 15 billion rand doesn't sound all that big. The next part of our small cap definition is fast growing. This one is hard to explain. It has to be viewed within context. So the starting point in determining company growth rates is obviously the economic growth rate of the country they operate in. Um, in South Africa, that's obviously our GDP growth rate. Understand that GDP tends to be uh, uh, reported excluding inflation companies report including inflation so in South Africa GDP growth rate of let's call it 1% if we're lucky this year and uh, uh, yeah, inflation rate through the year will probably be five or six percent let's go with six percent so you're looking at a company that's growing faster than GDP ie in the South African context growing faster than six percent a year that doesn't sound incredible um, but it's a starting point because something growing slower than that, you've got to ask why bother. Uh, next thing in the definition, small, fast growing, investable. Investable uh, is, is there's good and bad companies. Just because a company exists and just because a company is listed uh, and you can buy shares in it doesn't mean you should. Some companies are better than others. And the reason I put this investable into the definition is there is another class of small listed company that we call penny stocks. And I use this expression quite derogatory because they tend to be rubbish businesses. Um, and those tend to be value traps. You tend to lose money on them. Those are not what you're looking for. Small caps, the starting point is, is it investable? Is it a good business? 
Um, and then obviously listed. Uh, in this context, standing at the JSC, is it listed on the JSC? Uh, is it listed on exchange? Can you freely buy and sell shares with liquidity in the market? Uh, have you, if you notice this definition of small caps, I don't talk about sectors, industry, markets, even geographies. Um, they're really agnostic to that. These are small, fast-growing businesses that you can become part owners in, in a minority basis, assuming uh, uh, you don't buy the whole thing. Um, there is another term, mid-caps. Um, I am not going to use it other than here. Uh, the, rest of this, um, the rest of this presentation, I'm only going to use the word small caps. The reason for that is... Um, so this market cap size of 1 billion or 15, tell them I say hi, uh, 15 billion uh, market cap threshold for small caps. If you look at the small and mid cap indices on the JSC and you use the cutoff for small caps at 15 billion rand, you're actually including roughly two thirds of the mid cap index as well into that definition. The JSC our market is relatively small. What you find is a lot of our companies are small caps because we are small economy, small market, small companies. So mid caps in the, in the South African context tends to be uh, hom homogenous to small caps. They're interchangeable. Um, but in the global context, there is a differentiating factor. They tend to be a bit bigger than small caps, slightly lower growth, but smaller than blue chips and uh, faster growing. Just here's an interesting point. I'm going to keep coming back to this. Everyone likes to talk about the all share index, so the JSC. And everyone knows the top 40 index, the 40 biggest companies on the JSC that fall into the top 40 index. So we've explained what market caps are. If, if you take the top 40 index and you view it as a size in terms of market caps on the JSC, it is roughly 84% of the entire JSC is those 40 companies. The rest is only 16%. But understand, those are only 40 different individual companies. So that's only 40 different individual shares you can buy. If you view an investable universe, not as the size of the company you're buying shares in, but the numbers of different companies that you can potentially buy shares in, and you view the JSC in, in terms of the same pie chart, but compared to the number of listed companies, not the size, the number, the top 40 is only 40 shares. It's only a quarter of the available shares that you can buy on the JSC from individual companies. The small and mid caps is 70, it's three quarters of the JSC is small and mid caps. So as an investor making decisions, why would you ignore three quarters of the market? Moving on, we know what small caps are. We know how they, how we find, well, we, we know the definition and we can see if a company matches that in the listed environment. So the next question is, sure, why should we invest in small caps? And I've touched on how it is actually three quarters of the investable options on the JSE are small caps. So that is a, a fairly strong uh, philosophical point for at least looking at them. But there are a couple others. Now, the point of making investments is obviously to make money. You want to generate returns, you want to grow your wealth, you want to do well. Uh, without that, everything else falls apart and it's pretty meaningless. Um, small caps, and once again, small and mid caps, you can see the two indices on that graph here. Um, small and mid caps tend to track each other. Like I said, they, they pretty much the, they fall into all the same definitions, uh, most of them. But in the long term, and note this graph goes back to the early 2000s, in the long term, you can see that small and mid caps as shares, as investments, outperform the bigger, slower blue chips. Uh, in this context, the top 40. So the starting point of why you want to invest in small caps is very, very simple. You get a higher investment return in the long term. Assuming you pick the right ones, assuming you do invest for the long term, because there are periods of great volatility into the credit crisis, where your outperformance in 06 and 07, your gap was very big between uh, top 40 and the mid caps and small caps. Look how the gap narrowed in points of stress, i.e. small and mid caps are more volatile. But they come 
So they come with more risk, and we'll touch on the risks. But they also come with more upside. Um, and the, the benefit, and this one is uh, the second benefit. So there's lots of benefits for this. Return is the obvious one. The other one is diversification. <clears throat> now, not a lot of people consider this. It's worth viewing yourself as one full portfolio, not just your brokerage account. View yourself and all your assets as one full portfolio. Take your pension fund. It's probably invested, the equity portion is probably invested in the top 40. Take your RA. Your RA, probably some of it is at least invested in the top 40. Take their, your brokerage account. You probably have most of your brokerage account in what you consider safe top 40 companies. Once again, top 40, do you see how, if you don't view the JSC in terms of market cap, you view it in terms of listed investable options, you're only investing and duplicating exposure again and again and again in these things. And even more if you buy ETFs, almost all the ETFs play in the top 40, if not the top 60 companies. And you're just duplicating exposure to the same sets of companies, the same ones again and again and again. Sure, you're building capital, and hopefully it'll grow, and hopefully it'll do well. But another part about long-term investing and, uh, and growing your wealth is understanding that you've got to preserve capital. You've got to manage downside risk. And one of the simplest, the most obvious ways of doing this is diversification. So duplicating your exposure to the top 40 makes no sense when you can include small caps for a higher return from a bigger investable universe um, and it can actually lower your risk, not increase it, lower it, because you bring in companies you didn't hold into your portfolio. So we know what small caps are, small listed fast growing companies. They provide good upside um, in the long term, comes with risk and volatility. And at the same time, there is a diversification argument for them. So that is why we would consider small caps at least for an investment within the greater portfolio. I've touched on these risks, and uh, diversification is one of the ways you mitigate them, but that's a very high level way of explaining something. Uh, so let's touch on three major risks in this portion of the market. And there's an interesting point about these risks. The top two ones, fundamental and valuation risk, those ones exist in the top 42. So just by being in the top 40 doesn't mean you avoid those risks. Being an equity, full stop, you're exposed to those risks. But let's go through them, and I'll touch on briefly, and I'll keep coming back to ways we can mitigate these risks. Because if you want that upside, and you can avoid the downside, then you've got a fantastic investment uh, in front of you. So the starting point is what I call fundamental risk, i.e., you have picked the wrong business. The business goes bad. Ultimately, you're buying equity, you're buying slivers, and part ownerships in underlying companies. Now we know companies and businesses do well and they do badly. Um, business isn't, isn't a linear process. Um, so the fundamental risk is that, and this is where fundamental and valuation risk, the top 40 also has these. But small caps have them in a slightly bigger dose. What I mean by that is fundamental risk, the risk of business goes badly. A small cap is a smaller business, has less capital. It tends to have less margin for error when something goes wrong. Um, and or it may not have the marketing budget, may not have the scale, may not have the geographic diversification, it may not have returns to scale. Now, all of those things come over time as it grows and becomes a bigger business. And in fact, all of these risks are also how you make money in this space. If you think about it that way, if you're willing to take those risks and manage them, you can, you, you can uh, make, make money. So the starting point of managing fundamental risk is look, don't just buy random shares, look at the business whose shares you're buying in and consider the obvious question, is this a good business? Um, when I get to the part about picking stocks and picking small caps, we will touch on this fundamental risk and some of the things to look for. Next one is valuation risk. So fundamental risk, I picked the wrong business. Valuation risk, you could have picked the right business, maybe a fantastic business, but you paid too much for it. If you pay too much for it, the share price goes down. 
share price goes down, your investment loses money. So you pick the right business, but you're still losing money. So you have to be aware that uh, valuations come into account. Once again, this risk exists in the top 40. They tend to be more efficiently priced than the small caps. But understand that uh, the inefficient pricing in small caps, i.e. how wrong the valuation is of that share, can also be, um, can actually leave a lot of upside on the table. One of the, uh, one of the arts of investing is finding a great business that you pay too little for. And that's the best case scenario. But we'll go on that one. Valuation risk, the way you mitigate that is understanding valuations, um, considering them, and th that goes hand in hand with, with understanding the business. If the business is going to do better, am I willing to pay more for it? Or if the business is going to do poorly, should, should I not be paying significantly less for it, understanding multiples? Um, the final risk, and this one doesn't really, it does in patches and depends how big you are. For some fund managers, this exists, but for most of this room, I assume we're not sitting, there aren't many billionaires in this room. Um, so when you're buying shares in the top 40, you don't really have to worry about whether you can buy them, whether there's sellers of them, and whether you can sell them, i.e. there's other buyers of them. There, there tend to be a lot of volumes and liquidity in the, in, in, in the top 40. In small caps, they may not. Liquidity risk is ultimately the risk that you cannot sell your investment. This is slightly oversimplified because there's also liquidity risk when you enter your investment. But let's view it from this context, that uh, you cannot find a buyer at the price you're comfortable with of the volumes that you have for the share that you're looking to sell. So you, there may be a point where you cannot sell. Um, and there is a way to manage this risk that I'll touch on in a point. I want to make a, a key point before then, is that all three of these risks tend to happen at the same time. And say for a play out the scenario, you have picked a great small cap. You think you are right. It is a fantastic business. You haven't paid too much for it. And, there's, and it's very, very popular. So there's lots of people buying and selling it and everyone loves it. And it's all over the newspapers and it's a great popular fashionable stock to have. And then something goes wrong in that business. Suddenly fundamental risk kicks in. You misjudge the quality of the business that business isn't as good as you thought it was. That probably means that you overpaid for it. Valuation kicks in, and you probably are realizing this at exactly the same point that everyone in the market is realizing this. So suddenly it goes from where there's all oh, lots of buyers and lots of sellers to nobody wants to buy their share, and the liquidity dries up. Consider that these risks often happen simultaneously. And so it's about avoiding all of them or you start to expose yourself to all of them. There is a way to manage all of these risks. And I'm absolutely biased offering this alternative. It's what I call indirect uh, route into small caps and we'll touch a lot more uh, on it. But you can outsource this. It's called a fund manager. He will make sure he picks the right businesses. He will make sure he doesn't overpay for the businesses. And if he's running a unit trust, he will guarantee you daily liquidity. So when you want your money, irrespective of anything happening in the world, you will get your money. It's his risk in the background that he's got to manage all of that. Um, so we know the risks. Well, we know small caps are. We know that they're great to invest in, they offer some benefits to us, they're completely viable if we use them in, in a, uh, how, how shall I say it, in a conscientious manner. Um, and there are three key risks to circum, uh, circumvent or at least be aware of uh, uh, in this approach. So how do you actually invest in small caps? So there's really two routes, and I've touched on this one, there's, uh, which is the indirect route where you give your money to a fund manager who invests solely in small caps. There is the direct route that I will touch on uh, in the next slide where you yourself invest in small caps. Well, let's talk through the two different routes, and there's only really four steps. Um, the simplicity underlies that in both 
both uh, routes, indirect, putting it into a small cap fund or direct picking your own small caps, is that uh, there is one key step in all of them. And I'll touch on it in both times. So investing in a fund, the starting point is obviously to decide how much. So we've done a lot of work and we've run scenarios. Um, and we're starting with the regulation 28 compliant portfolio. So there's various asset allocations that you have to have in that. And then you have your equity allocation. The reason I'm starting with that is because pension funds and the like, well, hopefully all are regulation 28 compliant. So you may or may not be aware, but you're probably more or less regulation 28 compliant in your personal capacity. Um, so consider on the equity portion, across the portfolio, how much should you wait? And there's really three baskets of risk. There's low risk individuals, medium risk, and high risk. And a way to understand this is that a low risk individual perhaps uh, has a very short time horizon. He may need his money very soon. Medium risk individual has a longer time horizon, and a high risk individual has, a, has the longest time horizon there is available, perhaps the rest of their life, which could be decades. Um, and in all of these, the, there it's, I use a range. We've come up with a range because it ultimately comes down to a personal decision. And all of those ranges include zero. Small camps may not be for you. It's just like any other investment option. It's essentially a subcategory of the equity asset class. It may not be fitting your profile at all, no matter if you're low risk or high risk. But um, anywhere between 10% to 75% of your equity can be allocated to this part and it starts to enhance returns while diversification plays in and you start to get very nice risk adjusted returns and the longer and longer and longer you look at it. Um, so starting point, and I won't say this in the next slide because it's also there, but I've explained it uh, comfortably, I hope. How much do you want to invest? Now you know how much you want to invest. Next point is, well, simple. You've decided you're not going to do this directly. You're going to outsource. You're going to pay someone to do this and take all the risk on your behalf. Which fund, which small cap fund do you look at? Um, I will bring up a couple of things to look at if you decide to go that route. Um, and that's the key decision here. Then the other two are actually quite simple. They're logistical decisions. Once you've decided how much you're going to allocate, once you've decided which fund you're going to allocate to, the obvious uh, uh, question is how are you going to allocate? Lump sum or debit order? My advice is that it is always great to put a lump sum in and be invested from day zero. Most of us are earning salaries. Most of us are not billionaires sitting on hundreds of millions of free cash that we can deploy. Using a debit order has multiple benefits. First of all, it matches your investment to your cash flows. Second of all, it averages into that investment. So a small cap fund will tend to have volatile, uh, a volatile unit price. That means even if you did a lump sum and you just picked the wrong time, for a period of time, you may actually be down on your investment. Debit orders are, are a very useful way of, of averaging into investment. The fund, the fund I run, a lot, a lot of people I've seen have used the combination. They've put in the lump sum and they've set up a debit order. So they capture a bit of both. But consider how you're going to do it. Then the third thing, so after the entire process, do nothing. And that is why. This investment proposition that Small Caps offers all of us works the best when you use it for the long term. Step four is important. Once you've decided how much you've allocated, do nothing. Put it into the fund, do nothing. Uh, and that's why when it goes to allocation, my advice is always rather allocate less than more. If you're not sure how much you're going to allocate, rather allocate less than more. You can always top it up down the line, but you don't want the scenario where you've allocated too much to a small cap fund or to your small cap portfolio and you need that money. So you have to start redeem, you have to start selling shares. You don't want that scenario. Rather allocate too little and up it over time as you get more comfortable. Then there's the, the direct route. Once again, similar starting question. How much do you want to allocate to? The second point though is much easier. Which stockbroker would you like? Between me and Simon, we probably know pretty much all of the stockbrokers in South Africa, and we're sitting at the JSC, and on their website they list them. Stockbrokers are easy to find. There are plenty of them out there. 
I would expect everyone here to have a bank. That's probably a good starting point. Almost all banks, as far as I'm aware of in South Africa, have stockbrokers. Um, there's independent stockbrokers. There are plenty of stockbrokers. Find the one that works for you in terms of cost, in terms of service, in terms of access, in terms of platform. Um, open an account, which will be a bit messy because we have joyful, happy things called Fika. Um, and then this is the difficult point. And this is just like in here where you select the small cap fund, here you are the small cap fund. Here you make the investment decisions once you've done it. Um, and your starting point, and the trick is this is a loop because once you're doing this process, you're never not doing this process. Find the small caps you like, buy them, keep following them because companies change, news flow comes out, better companies appear, sell them if things change, return to step one, carry on finding companies, carry on deploying capital, carry on building investments, uh, all the time being cognizant of risks. Now, step one is probably the hardest, and if you did step one perfectly correctly, and you happen to Somehow, because no one gets this right, not even professionals, no one, even Warren Buffett has sold investments. If you get step one right, you buy the right shares, you might never need to sell them. You might never need to look at the rest. But it's always good to keep abreast of it. And then, like I said, do nothing. These are long-term investments. They only work if you give them time to compound and you ignore the day-to-day -day volatility and allow the annualized and year-to-year -year and decade-to-decade -decade volatility and growth rates to help you. So I've mentioned indirect investing into small caps and direct investing. You can allocate to funds or you can be the fund yourself. Understand there's cost consequences before I even go on. You allocate to a fund, you're paying the fund manager. It's simple. Uh, and when you redeem, there'll be a capital uh, gains uh, implication, but that's only when you redeem. So maybe 10, 20, 30 years time. If you're investing on your own, there's stock brokerage fees, there's trading fees, and each individual investment you buy and sell, each time you sell, it's a disposal event for tax purposes. So you will be triggering tax in your own name. So there's lots of pros and cons. Um, I would actually argue that either way is equally costly. Um, and there's the moment you take into account the cash flows of the tax, the stock brokerage, admin and stuff, it's actually pretty much the same as, as, as of, uh, paying a fund manager because a fund manager gets much lower uh, institutional uh, brokerage fees and doesn't pay tax within the, within the unit trust he's operating. So it's much of a muchness. It just depends on personal preference and the confidence in your ability to do this or the confidence in your ability for the fund manager to do this. Um, so, assuming you decide to go the route of being investing in the small cap fund, what are the obvious things to look at? What makes this fund better than that fund? Um, I like to work on simple uh, checklists. It's always good to have rule of thumbs and checklists and uh, something that you can walk out of here and hopefully you remember. The starting point is mandate. Every fund has a mandate and that mandate is essentially a contract between the fund manager and all his investors that that is exactly the only way he's going to run this fund and these are the only things he's going to buy and sell. So in South Africa you have to ask the question that is it actually a small cap fund and the way you find that is what they call in the CISA classification, a CISA is the governing body. It's quite simple. You can see it will say small cap fund on its fact sheet or it won't. The reason I bring this up is there's one or two funds in South Africa that do in fact invest in small caps, but they are not small cap funds. What that means is that the fund manager, if you have decided you've allocated 20% to a small caps, you've decided to put it into this fund and you go on with your life, you never look at it. Ten years later, you may look at it and realize he's bought gold. He hasn't bought small caps. At the time you invested in it, there were small caps in it, but his mandate allowed him to do anything he wanted outside of that, and he wasn't forced to invest in small caps, so he could invest outside of it. So if you're going to allocate to small caps, allocate to a small cap mandate. That way you know and you have the security that that portion of the portfolio is absolutely 100% exposed to that market. Next one is strategy. All fund managers operate with different styles and different philosophies. The, market, the marketplace, the stock market, is essentially a battlefield of philosophies uh, where the winner makes lots of money and the loser loses lots of money. Um, see, first of all, 
the fund manager should explain how he is in, not what his mandate is, but how he is investing within his mandated universe. And there's lots of different styles. There's value, growth, momentum. There's plenty of guys who benchmark hug, which is actually a derogatory word. Um, but the starting point is one, he should explain to you how he invests. And it should be in a way that you understand. Two, you should agree with it. Just because he drops really, really smart terminology on you doesn't mean he's right. Make sure you understand how he's doing it, what his style is or his strategy. Um, make sure you're comfortable with it. And here's the subtle point. Make sure he's actually doing it. There's been a good couple fund managers in South Africa who were arguably glorified marketers. Very, very good at standing up and explaining what their strategy is. Very, very good at defending their strategy. Not very good at executing it. So they did poorly. Make, and this is where you, it works to have a look at his, once you understand his philosophy, pull out his portfolio. You can get that on Bloomberg and MoneyWeb, on his fact sheets, should have a, a good couple holdings. Work through some of those stocks. Just see if you think he's actually executing his, uh, his methodology, his strategy. Next one is costs. Um, this is actually not a very controversial topic. And by saying that, I'm being controversial ironically. Um, in this, particularly in the small cap space, there aren't ETFs in South Africa. There just aren't. So there are no passive strategies. So what you're making sure of is not that, hey, he, I can get this as a really, really cheap ETF. What you're making sure of um, is that he is not charging you too much. Sometimes in the investment world, when you're paying for a person's services, you get what you pay for. So I would argue you don't want his, his costs to be too high, but you also don't want them to be too low. My rule of thumb is there's a thing called a total expense ratio. Make sure it is not, sorry, both of these signs, oh, there we go, there's the not. It is not greater than 2%, and make sure his total cost ratio is not greater than 3%. Um, if you want to know what those terms mean, I'm quite happy to explain them, but that's a long explanation. I'm not going to like, uh, waste time in this presentation to do that. Just make sure you're not paying too much for it. Um, then there's the obvious point. Now, all of these things you're looking at are pretty much filters to find the right thing and to mitigate all the risks so that you can generate returns. So make sure he's making money. Check his returns. Check his annualized returns. Check him versus benchmark. Check him versus peers. Is he beating his peers? Is he beating the market? Is he beating his benchmark? If he isn't, at least in the long term, questions have to be asked. Next one is trust. Do you trust the fund manager? And that was uh, Christia and I, before the presentation, were talking about this. And ultimately, in financial services, there's, there's there's a pool of RP sitting in each person doing a job. And it is much more complicated than simply delivering the pool of RP. You've got to trust that he actually has your own benefits in mind. Uh, and, and he is doing a good job and you can trust him to execute that. And you can trust that even though he has a good track record and his costs aren't bad and his, his mandate is great and you like his strategy, he doesn't change it. You trust him to follow his word. Um, and probably just a point on trust, a, a good way of doing that is read his commentary. Get to know the, the guy. You don't always have an opportunity to meet fund managers, and I respect that. But get to read his commentary. Perhaps even find him on Twitter. Follow him. Uh, get to understand how he thinks. Get to understand if the way he thinks is consistent. It's also worth chatting to colleagues in the industry. Guys have reputations. Maybe some of your colleagues know some of their reputations. It's n Google him. See if he's ever been involved in fraud. See if he's ever, ever ran a fund that collapsed and disappeared to appear somewhere else to run this fund. It's worth considering these things. Um, so let's take this ch uh, uh, checklist and let's apply it to my fund. Um, and just right up front, uh, that last bullet point, yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit biased to go through that one, so I'm not going to check that one. I'll leave that one up to you guys. Um, but 
so my, my small and mid-cap fund, it's an alpha wealth prime small and mid-cap fund. Its mandate is a CISA classification small and mid-cap. Bang, tick box. It is a small cap fund. My strategy is a quality bias. My starting point in the small and mid-cap space is, is it a good business? If it's not a good business, I do not look further. So I take the massive universe and I filter it down to what I believe are the very best listed businesses out there in my universe. Then I start to consider valuation, growth, other financial metrics, strategy, blend across the portfolio, etc., etc. All the way that I can narrow it down to of the best businesses, I find the best investments. And from that, I build a portfolio of, of what I believe are absolute high conviction investments that are concentrated. My aim is to only to hold 15 to 20 of them. From an investable universe of 140 to 240 stocks, I narrow it down to 15 to 20, and that's all I hold. Um, so that's the strategy. Costs, the A-class units, the TUR ratio, 1.5, total cost ratio, 2.2. Uh, so pretty industry standard, and if you compare that versus uh, most of the peers, most of the industry, it's give or take the same. Um, returns, uh, so you, you can see the funds since inception, um, comfortably beating the benchmark, and uh, versus the peers, it's quite comfortably ranked as one since, since inception. So um, I like to think that at least on my harsh checklist, my fund checks out to it. It's worth noting, um, I'm not going to tell you to trust me. Um, I'm not going to tell you I'm, I'm such a nice guy. Uh, I am going to tell you that I've put most of my net worth into my fund. So that, I believe, is probably the best way to align interests with investors. And that's how I think not just small cap funds, bear in mind, if you're looking at other funds, I think you can use the same checklist on it. Uh, it's worth, worth working your way through the universes with that. Then, say you don't want to give a fund manager anything. Say you feel confident that in your ability to run and manage your own portfolio. You have a good stockbroker. Perhaps you've invested in top 40 stocks uh, for many years. You're comfortable with the way the market works. You have access to information. And or you're willing to put in the time and effort and skill yourself up to do this. Then you're going to be investing directly. You yourself will be picking the small caps to invest in. So here is a, is a starting point, was a checklist for finding the small caps and comparing them versus, uh, versus this to see if at least you're in the right direction. Now, li literally, every single bullet point on this slide can be a presentation on its own. And in, in fact, this one about valuation, PhDs have been, and books and volumes and libraries have been written about. It's worth noting, there's uh, Simon at the back who introduced me. He's got a website, justonelap.com. I have previously given full, I, I think, hour-long presentations on literally just profitability, just solvency, just liquidity, just ma uh, management, and a whole lot on valuation. Uh, perhaps go have a look at that website, find those webinars, and, and listen to them. They might be a bit dated, but uh, they were done a good couple of years ago. But the theory is there. So let's work our way through the basics of this checklist. Profitability. Well, you're buying shares. That means you're part ownership in underlying business slash businesses. So you've got to start with the question, what is the point of business? And ignore all the soft, fluffy uh, CSR stuff. The point of business in, uh, is profitability. So you've got to ask the question, is the business that I'm looking at as profitable as it can be? Is it more profitable than its peers? Is it more profitable than other businesses? That's a very, very, very key question. And one of, like, some metrics you can look at is return on equity, gross profit margin. There's as many metrics as you want in this space. But always ask the question, is this business profitable? And in fact, a bolt-on question this, is it, will it remain profitable? That's a very important one to consider. Solvency is another thing to look at. Solvency is a really fancy word for debt. So intuitively, if I sit down in front of you and I say on my right-hand side, um, I have an individual with a lot of debt, and on my left-hand side, I have an individual with no debt who's living a riskier life. Intuitively, you tell me the guy with lots of debt. Companies and businesses are no, no different. Debt has value, and it can enhance returns, but as a rule of thumb, 
like I said, full lectures can be done of this. We can go into a lot more detail. As a rule of thumb, the more debt a business has, the riskier, not necessarily the business, but its funding structure behind it. And the funding structure implodes or cannot meet its covenants or things go wrong, debt amplifies that. So you want to, in the perfect case scenario, you want the most profitable business in the world with not a single cent of debt. You can look at things like debt to equity, interest, interest cover. All these ratios, by the way, are relative ratios. The reason I say that is things are relative to company sizes and businesses. So if I told you, I told you one business has, has debt of 100 million and another business has debt of a billion, who's more indebted? You actually don't have enough information to tell me that because the debt, the company with 100 million debt may only be a 50 million rand in size company and that's incredibly indebted. Whereas the billion rand debt company may actually be a hundred billion rand in size. So it's actually only got 1% Gary. Same with ROE, same with those sort of things. Ratios are relative because they allow us to compare like with like irrespective of company sizes and circumstances. Use ratios, get comfortable with them if you're going this path of direct investing. Next one is liquidity. Now this is very, very important. Back here where I talk about risks, and I talk about liquidity risk, I'm talking specifically about the ability to buy and sh sell shares in the market. This liquidity risk is not that. It is the company's liquidity risk, and the best way to understand that is how much cash does this company generate and how easy does it pay its expenses and debts as they fall due. That's internal liquidity to a company. It's not applicable to the share. It's only applicable to the company. Rule of thumb in liquidity is cash is king. Um, so in the perfect case scenario, and all of these ones are numerical, you can, you can calculate mathematically, and you can see on a piece of paper um, how companies stack up against each other. So in the perfect case scenario, you want the most profitable business in the world with not a, a cent of uh, debt that is creating huge amounts of cash day to day and has very little debts and creditors and expenses to settle. That's a perfect case scenario company in the world. In reality, they start to trade off against each other and it's all about finding the right ratios and, and balances. Uh, then you get management. Now, I'm in a privileged role as a fund manager where it is my job uh, like all day, every day, to go and research companies and meet management teams and meet CEOs and understand their strategies, understand how they run their businesses, talk one-on-one -on -one with them, throw them difficult questions, really get to know them intimately um, and come up with a, a, not just an assessment of the profitability, solvency and liquidity of the business, but also the sense of the, the capability of the management. As a retail investor, you probably don't have access to management like that. You probably uh, don't have time like that. There is another way to look at the quality of management, and this one is a, is a, is a golden rule of thumb. Consider how much of the company, the company's own shares that management team owns, and consider how much salary they pay themselves as a board. In the best case scenario, do you agree as an investor in the scenario where a management team owns a huge amount of a company's shares? So they directly, they're not just management, they're actually shareholders as well. And they pay themselves not a cent of salary. Is that not a fantastic alignment of interest to you as a shareholder coming in? Because they make money if the share price goes up. They lose money if the share price goes down. They don't make money on salaries. The worst case scenario, and these are the ones to avoid, to be very, very skeptical of management, is where management hold not a single share in a company that they manage and pay themselves massive salaries with huge cash bonuses. Because the, the question has to be asked, how are they making their money? Because that's how they're going to run the business. They are not making the money based on the share or the equity, they're making the money based on their salaries. Basically, their job is to wind and down the remuneration committee at board level and just make sure that they're still employed and then they will make huge amounts of money. And you'll probably find that share goes nowhere if not starts collapsing. That's a good way of understanding management.
Consider incentive. Humans act according to incentives. Next one is valuation. Like I said, that's a whole nother topic, but always consider it. Is it cheap? And probably a good way to ask this question is if you bought this share right now and you were a seller, um, would you want to part with it? All things, are, all things being considered. And if you hold it um, and things were, things were meandering along and doing what you expected with the share price, was staying flat. The share price was doing nothing. Neither going up, neither going down. Would you want to sell it? Um, but that, like I said, that's a whole other another topic. Then there's, now, like I said, at fund management level, you're outsourcing like a lot to the fund manager. If you're picking individual stocks and you're making an individual investment decisions on your own, what you're doing is you're building a portfolio. So you cannot be oblivious to the things that you hold in that portfolio. And sometimes you may find a great share to buy, but not buy it because you hold another share. This is within the portfolio managing your risk and exposures. Whole nother topic, and I'm saying that a lot tonight, but um, a rule of thumb, and this is a very simple rule of thumb, and it's a good way to understand it. If you find, so you've got a portfolio of small caps, right? You find another share that you quite like. You have a look at it. Consider if what that company does is similar in any way to what any of the other companies you are holding in your portfolio do. If it is, the odds are you're creating duplication in your portfolio. You're not just not diversifying, you're actually concentrating risk. What I mean by that is say I bought, um, I was looking at Supergroup, which is a logistics provider, and I hold Value Group, which is also a logistics provider. Intuitively, you don't want to hold both of them. You want to hold just one of them. You want to hold the best one out of the two. So as a good rule of thumb, don't create duplications of exposure in your portfolio. The best portfolio is a collection of fantastic assets that do completely different things. Because then you've got all the upside with the benefits of proper and true diversification. So let's take this checklist. And uh, out of this checklist, I won't really be commenting on management. Uh, that gets a bit personal. Um, but I will be, w w and obviously won't be uh, commenting on a portfolio fit. I do not know what you're holding. This is not investment advice. Um, because everything has to be viewed within context of the portfolio and your existing holdings and the like. But I'll take all the rest and I'll compare them. Um, we've got three now. Also, a disclaimer right up front, all three of these companies are hold within my Alpha oh, Wealth Prime Small and Mid Cap Fund. So, sure, I might be biased and talking my book, but I've also put my money where my mouth is and I'm backing my convictions on these. So, the first one is Santova. It's a non asset based supply chain manager. It's a really, really fancy way of saying that you can outsource your supply chain to Santova. They've got some great technology that automates a huge amount of that uh, the process. Did my mic just drop there? Oh, okay, sorry, it sounded a bit different here. So they've got, they've got uh, a great in-house technology that automates a huge amount of that process. They've got um, geographic operations in a large number of places around the world, from UK, Europe, into Africa, Australia, into Asia. They're steadily and slowly opening up more and more trade routes. And they can, from all the way on this side or that side of the ocean, source, clear, import, ship, warehouse, and everything else for its clients so, such that a client only sees the product when it rocks up at its door or its customer only sees a product when it rocks up at their door. So it's essentially a, a, niche, uh, a niche outsourcing provider utilizing technology and geographic presence. Um, it's, it's at this point, over half of its profits come from outside of South Africa, which is quite a nice pos position to be in. Um, and its investment case is actually quite intuitive. The first, first thing is there is an ability to grow its profits from 10 to 30%, if not more than that. These are estimates. 
for the next 10 plus years. So it's got a very, very long runway of growth, which you want as a long-term investor. And the reason I can say that is this st statistic. Not just does it have a very competitive value proposition in the service it offers and its technology platform um, and its growing geographic presence, but global trade is a massive market. If Santova only captured 0.1%, now let me put this in context, that is one thousandth of global trade. Its revenue would rise 600 times. It would probably be a top 40 company by then. And that's just one thousandth of global trade. Um, and it can steadily carry on growing and picking up clients and the like. Um, there's, there's a lot of runway for this business. Something that's quite nice is I like to show my investment cases with graphs. They're very intuitive to understand as well. So in Santover's case, there aren't really local listed comparatives. So I've pulled the international peers. And if you look at Santover's five-year growth rate, it's faster growing than its peers. And some of those peers are 100 times bigger. The reason it's faster growing is because when you're a small, agile company, you can gain market share that makes very little difference to competitors and markets. But for you, it creates a massive difference because you've got such a low base growing from. So Santova is growing faster than its peers. And here's the trick. You can buy it for pretty much less. So we've got a business with a lot of growth potential that is delivering on that growth potential with the long track record that as an investment, remember the valuation risk, I'm paying not just the same as peers, I'm paying less. So Santova is one I really like. There's the Rolfs Group. So Rolfs Group is best described as a diversified niche chemicals group. That sounds like a paradox, but it's because they've got niche products diversified across a range of industries. From agri, there's some mining, industrial, there's some export, there's uh, food, there's water, range of uh, different industries. Um, it's important to note because two listed comparatives on the JSC is Omnia and AECR. And this, I think, is the opportunity in this stock is as a small chemicals company, it gets painted with the same brush. And both of these companies have done poorly because one, they sell uh, explosives into mines. So that's directly tied into the production profile of mines, which obviously aren't doing well. And then two, they sell fertilizer into agri, which in South Africa in a drought is not going to be a booming client base. So you've got two major pillars of your business doing badly at the same time. Rolfs does neither. Neither sells explosives into mines, nor sells fertilizer into agri. It sells niche products in niche markets, much more diversified than its peers. I would actually argue the quality of its underlying earnings is better than its peers. And in fact, I think I can prove that. If you look at Rolfs on a profitability basis over rolling five years, so a good amount of history, it's not just that it had a good year last year, but actually if, over five years, it's a proven track record, its return on its equity is much higher than its peers. You can see that only, even in some cases, higher than um, massive international peers and global averages. So it's more profitable than almost all the other businesses operating in this segment. And once again, same as Santova, I um, happen to be paying the least for it. So I've got what I view as a safer business, more diversified, that is more profitable, and I'm paying the least for it. That's, that's a, and management, by the way, are actually big shareholders in this as well, so there's very strong alignment. Um, then data tech is another one. Data tech I include because it's a slightly misunderstood business. It's, got, it's a global business. There is no local comparative. If there was a local comparative, which would be Pinnacle Technology and would be Mustek, the real problem is both of those uh, businesses are domestic businesses. They only really do this in South Africa. Data Tech does that on pretty much every continent across the world. In literally tons and tons and tons of countries, lots and lots of operations. Uh, it's truly a global RCT distributor. Um, and, in, and if I compare it versus its true peers, which aren't listed on the JSC, its true peers, 
are, are these two businesses, Ingram Micro and Tech Data Corp. Both of them are global technology distributors. Bang. Global and distribution, that's data tech, not Pinnacle and Mustech. They, they, they're just domestic. So the moment I compare these, uh, let's have a look at them in terms of quality metrics, profitability. Is this a good business? Is it safe? Data tech is more profitable on a gross profit margin than its peers. It has a higher EBITDA margin and a higher five-year rolling ROE. And to boot, it actually has less debt. In fact, in this case, it has net cash. Um, whereas peers actually have a lot of debt. So we have a business that's more profitable and arguably safer in terms of a debt profile at least. Um, then let's have a look at relative valuations. So we could take, the, um, let's compare data tech versus its peers. On price earnings, you'd say, sure, I'm, I'm paying roughly the same. Cool, there isn't a lot of, lot of value left on the table. But in price to book, much cheaper. EV EBITDA, much cheaper. So across three valuation metrics, two out of three indicate it's cheaper. On quality metrics, all of them indicate it's better. Um, this is an example of, of, of a business that starts to tick those boxes. So we talked through three examples. Um, let's go right back to the beginning. Let's summarize and let's open up for uh, questions. So first of all, we worked out what small caps are. Small, uh, fast growing investable listed companies. We worked out that as an opportunity set on the stock market, there are more of them than anything else. So you're ignoring three quarters of the JSC if you don't invest in these. And you might want to invest in them or at least consider them as a portion of a portfolio because they're both high, higher in growth and you can see that at the index level, even higher than the index level, you pick the right ones, or, the, or your fund manager picks the right ones, and they bring diversification. Like I said, consider yourself as an holistic portfolio. You don't want to be overweight top 40, uh, any more so than perhaps you want to be. But just consider duplication in that, in that market. Uh, they do have risks. There's the traditional equity risks, which also exist in the top 40 and exist in equity everywhere around the world. There's fundamental risk. You pick the wrong business. It does badly. There's the valuation risk. You overpay for the share. It does badly. And in small caps, there is the illiquidity risk. Fundamental risk, you get through research. Valuation risk, you get through research. Liquidity risk, you can manage as a retail client depending on your individual positions. Or you could take all three risks and outsource them to a fund manager and purely give him your money, put it into a small cap fund. And hence, I've touched on the two routes to this market. Direct, being your own fund manager. And indirect, through a fund. Guys, I'm impressed you're still here. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, uh, you hit it perfectly in the nail. We're exactly an hour, and I know we're power hours. So we'll take two quick questions, and then Keith will head out to the open area. Then we can take more questions out at the back if people have got them. We've got one at the back over there. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> thanks for the opportunity. Just a quick one. What is your opinion on the buying the share of, on the small cap versus uh, buying the I'm talking more particularly in uh, the fund managers because uh, I looked at the history. I found that uh, they actually outperform the share price, outperform their, their funds. For instance, you look at the... the so so, so there's, there's a couple of things to consider here. First of all is your personal competence. If you're comfortable enough building and managing your own investments, probably don't outsource it. Don't take it to a fund manager. Um, if you're not or you believe someone can do it better, that's a viable route. Those are, that's the obvious consideration. The next one is more subtle. When you compare the share price to a fund manager's performance, you're actually comparing the gross return to the net return. Because in order to buy that share and sell that share, there'll be brokerage costs. If you did it in your own name, there'll be brokerage costs. And when you sell, there'll be capital gains taxes. And in order to have that facility, you'll be paying a broker, probably admin or monthly fees and the like. And once you, once you start to annualize all of those into your cost base, and don't just view the share price in isolation as a paper return, view your entire brokerage account as a mini fund and view its returns net 
after those costs, then you're starting to compare like with like. Um, and in that case, you know, if you're outperforming the fund manager, by all means, that's but a I, viable route. So the route I thought it came from is to buy anchor rather than an anchor fund. Yes, because they are fund managers. You, uh, another example is coronation. I mean, you look at the Sorry, tennis. I completely misunderstood <laughs> the question. Well, I hope that was interesting anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, look, you look at coronation. I mean, yeah. it, it made over a thousand percent over the last uh, 10 years. Compared that with any of uh, their, their fund, it's, it's, it's incomparable. I yeah. mean, Anchor has made over hundred percent within a year. So there's a couple of things to consider. First of all, any long only, well, predominantly long only equity fund manager has been through an incredibly long period now. Market's been doing really, really well up until about 12, 18 months ago. Uh, and hence, their funds have been doing well. Hence, performance fees have been doing well. Hence, their profits have been doing well. And hence, their shares have been doing well. Those long only equity fund managers' shares tend to be essentially geared plays on the stock market. So if you think the stock market's going to go up, you can buy, uh, uh, for example, Coronation or Anchor. And the stock market goes up 10%, they might do 15 or 20%. But if the market goes down, they'll do worse. Um, so there's that consideration to play to understand not just, hey, it's a fund manager or it's an asset manager I'm buying shares in, what actually are the funds they're offering? Because that changes the risk profile of that individual stock. Then the second thing to consider is, sure, instead of putting all your money into, say, um, and I'm not going to name names, XYZ fund, you put it into XYZ fund manager, right? <laughs> you're still holding one stock. You have an absolutely concentrated portfolio. Something goes wrong there. Sure, you might get the upside. Something goes wrong there, you get all the downside. As opposed, if you put it into the fund, you would get a diversified portfolio. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, it's not, uh, the market, navigating the market is not just a game of making money. It's also a game of avoiding losing money. Coronation down 50% in the last... 18 months or so. Whereas their funds aren't down 50%. No. Uh, Christia? Is there a small or mid-cap kind of SWIX index that you can use to see how liquid a company, a small cap company is? Or how would a retail investor know, how would I know that a company has a lot of liquidity? So, short answer, no, there isn't an index like this in this space. Um, slightly longer answer is li liquidity is ultimately a function of uh, the value, on average, traded in the market. So um, if you have a broker and you're doing this on your own, your broker should have access to data. If not, you should have an online website via the broker and have access to this data directly yourself. Either which way, get the data, get a year's um, history of the shares being traded, put it in the Excel spreadsheet, calculate the average value traded on a daily basis. And then consider whether your investment in that company is bigger or smaller than an average daily traded. Liquidity is always relative. If you're making a one rand investment, which is even the least liquid stock in the, in the market is probably liquid enough for you. If you're making a hundred million rand investment, uh, a reasonably liquid small cap probably won't be for you. Um, so liquidity is always relative to the size that you'll be investing. Does that make sense? Uh, and Google Finance gives you one year of historic JC data. Uh, last question, so yes. yes. Oh, Keith, great presentation. Eh? So Thanks, man. If we are downgraded to, to chance data, what impact will it have on equities to exit on small caps? <laughs> so the short answer is it's already happened. The market has priced us not just as junk, it's priced us one notch below junk. The market has already valued in not this downgrade, but the next downgrade we're going to get afterwards. So if we don't get the downgrade, imagine an incredible amount of upside that's going to come. If we do get the downgrade, but we don't get one afterwards, it's probably still upside. Um, and if everything plays out according to, uh, according to the way the market has priced it, well, it's already happened in the market. The real risk is not share prices here. 
The real risk is how does the downgrade affect our economy? Now, small mid-caps, and 10 years ago, 20 years ago, most small mid almost all of them were domestic businesses. So you were essentially indirectly investing in the South African economy. Um, now, like a good amount of them, like Santova, Datatech, both of them are pretty much offshore global businesses, uh, even though they're small caps. But a lot, of, a lot of small caps still remain largely plays on South Africa. So if the downgrade, and there's an argument that there's a very strong correlation between downgrades and uh, recessions. If we get hit in a recession, then you start to see profits struggling. And profits struggle, uh, share prices follow. Uh, or if not, precede. So, um, but we're also coming out of a period where pretty much that's happened. So it is hard to say at a macro level if there's much more downside. Um, and that's, that's why I prefer not to make broad statements. I prefer stock picking. Because even in a bad economy, in a bad time, there's still great companies. And that management team and their business will navigate the circumstances. Um, so uh, equity can be a very agile asset class, but um, it's a long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> but, and I'll finish it with something a little aside. In essence, we've had a 25% bear market because our market has gone sideways for two years and change. And over that period, we've had a 25% increase in earnings. Not an annualized 25% increase in earnings, a 25% increase in earnings in the top 40, which means that in essence, valuations are 20% don't lower which kind of plays into Keith's answer there. Don't view our market um, in rands. View yeah. our market in US dollars. Imagine you're a global investor. Our market peak to trough halved. We've gone through that. The peak yeah. is, the trough has happened. Well, we may not be aware of it, but in dollar terms, our market has crashed. And it has crashed New York, badly. Um, like I said, how much is it? How much, it's the eternal question. How much is already priced in? We'll tell you if on not Monday. More. <laughs> <laughs> Monday. Ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there. We have run out of time. Uh, my thanks so. to all of you for attending to the JSC, for arranging, and of course to Keith McLaughlin for availing his time. Uh, back next month in Johannesburg. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks.